Oh, the Toyota Supra, a car that was ultimately a complete and utter sales flop that with the help of some Hollywood fame and super high horsepower examples, creating viral automotive videos during YouTube's rise and cemented the Supra as a household name of legacy, performance, and clout. But now with five generations of Supra, there's a ton of options out there for you to get your hands on a performance-oriented JDM piece of history, and they're all kind of at varying different price points. But which one of those generations is going to put the biggest smile on your face for the least amount of money? Which one is gonna be more fun to drive, more capable, and attract the most attention? Because let's be honest, this is an important thing for most of us. Or maybe more importantly, which one is gonna be the best combinations of those things and take home the W on this episode of what generation is best Toyota Supra. But before we jump right in, I gotta hit you with the plug. If you're enjoying the content, subscribe. Our team works extremely hard to bring you daily content. And give the video a thumbs up. It helps us get in front of a bunch of other car enthusiasts just like yourself. And if you ever need anything, wheels, tires, or suspension, come see your boy over at fitmentindustries.com. We have literally over a million different wheel and tire packages, ceramic coating options, plus accessories, and a bunch of merchandise. You don't even have to wait for your delayed tax return. You can build now and pay with your tax return later, guys, with as low as 0% financing from a firm. These guys are rock stars. And if you like oddball cars and want to see some behind the scenes action here at Fitment Industries, give me a follow on the good old IG at SeanB.FI. Let's get started. Contrary to popular belief, the Supra didn't debut as its own car. Supra was actually introduced to the world as more of a trim level of the Toyota Celica in 1979 that would designate the six cylinder performance variant of the Toyota Celica. The first generation A40 Celica Super was based on the popular Celica liftback design, but it was both longer and wider than the regular four cylinder Celica liftback to make room for that larger 2.6 liter inline six, which was the first Toyota produced engine to be equipped with electronic fuel injection and produced a very modern at the time, 110 horsepower. The new $9,500 Celica Super was available with both a manual and an automatic transmission and came standard with front and rear independent suspension. Wow, and four wheel disc brakes, which in 1979, eh, that technology was pretty breakthrough, to be honest. Outside of the addition of luxury items, such as optional leather trimmed seating and automatic climate control, the Supra remained relatively unchanged until 1981, where the Supra became the 850 and was given a 2.8 liter single overhead cam engine that bumped power up to a whopping 116 and was optionally available with a new sport suspension package that was supposed to improve handling. For 1982, Toyota gave the Celica and the Celica Supra a complete new redesign. Now available as two distinct models, the Celica Supra L-Type starting at $13,500 and the Celica Supra Performance, which tacked on there an additional $1,000. The Celica Supra also received another engine upgrade here as well with the new 5M GE, which was still a 2.8 liter, but it now had two cams over the head and produced nearly 150 horsepower and just over 150 pound-feet of torque. Both the L-Type and the Performance Package Supras were pretty well mechanically identical and was mostly visual differences, such things as fender flares, wider wheels and tires, and a more sport-oriented interior. The A60 Celica Supra had a sloping hood with hideaway pop-up headlights with the angular roof and window line typical of the era to give you that era-appropriate aggressive wedged shape and featured suspension tuned by Lotus, which is still even a high praise today. The A60 Supra, although pretty expensive, became quite the success story and won Motor Trend's 1982 Import Car of the Year, and it even made Car and Driver's 10 Best List in 1983 and 1984. And by its final year in 1986, it made 161 horsepower and would have sold more than 115,000 A60 Supras in the United States. Then halfway through 1986, the Super brand was finally given its own identity and would no longer be part of the Celica Super range. But it would still feature that classic wedge shape with pop-up headlights and all the other 80s era styling cues that was oh so popular in its day. The new third generation A70 1986 and a half Supra received an even larger three liter six cylinder engine, still with dual overhead cams and would get a very significant power bump up to 200 horsepower. But then in 1987, Toyota doubled 
down on its performance success and aimed to take over the entire sports car market by adding a turbocharged 230 horsepower model to the lineup. Zero to 60 now took about six seconds, which meant it was a real sports car competitor at the time, straight out of the box. But not a lot of the cars stayed stock. While most of its domestic competition stayed naturally aspirated, the Super was actually able to make really decent power with just a few aftermarket parts that were really pretty much basic bolt-ons and then a little bit of software. Whereas to make a Camaro of the same vintage compete on the same power level, you would really need a lot of money and then you're gonna have to change the cam and the valve train or even change the heads altogether. The Mark III Super was also available with an optional Targa style sport roof to give the sports car buyers a nice convertible feel. But with the addition of all this new technology, a turbocharger and its extra components, the Super now weighed nearly 3,500 pork and pounds, which might not sound like a lot by today's standards, but this was nearly 300 pounds heavier than the V8 Mustang GT of similar vintage. However, despite the weight, magazines and consumers alike would come to praise the Mark III Super's ability to handle, thanks to its adjustable damping and limited slip differential. By the generation's end in 1992, the A70 Super would cost nearly $20,000 but it still sold just a hair shy of 110,000 units of Mark III Supra. And then in 1993, Toyota would let the world in on a little secret project they'd been working on. As it turns out, Toyota hired a bunch of mad scientists engineers with plans of complete and utter world domination with their eyes set on giving supercars a run for their money. The new fourth generation A80 Supra was a complete departure from past Supras. Performance was now the name of the game and despite the car being a little bit wider, the Mark IV Super Turbo was nearly 130 pounds lighter than the outgoing Mark III. The turbo model was hailed by many major magazines as a true world dominating sports car. The Mark IV Super Turbo ditched the old 7M GTE engine from the previous turbo generation, and in 1993, we would receive the 2JZ GTE, which utilized an iron block for extra strength and had a very stout rotating assembly, which would become famous for its ability to not kind of self-implode under high boost applications. This is also where you saw Toyota play around with sequential turbos. Essentially what this does is it allows one of the smaller turbos to spool up at 2,500 RPM for low end torque. And then there's a second larger turbo that spools up later in the RPM to make that big power at that higher RPM. This helped the Mark IV Super become one of the quickest cars that you could buy without going deep into the supercar realm and spending over six figures. With that being said, all this technology did make it very expensive. MSRP was up almost 35% in price over the previous generation, which is very steep, especially in the early 90s. And although the A80 Super absolutely demolished its competition in the magazine articles and in video games, the Mark IV Super sales were so low that Toyota seized all sales in the United States after 1998, with only 11,200 units being sold in that five-year run stateside. It was a complete and total flop of a consumer car. But over the years, the Super nameplate would gain fame and become a dream car for many after it was featured as a hero car in the Fast Movie Saga. Shortly following, we would start to see the explosion of self-produced street racing videos on DVD from the likes of Mischief, 1320 Video, Super Speeders, and then along came YouTube. And these all showcased 600, 800, 1,000 to 1,500 and beyond horsepower 2JZ Supers taking on the entire world. Its late bloom to world fame brought on an onslaught of people begging for a new Supra, to which Toyota said, Fuck off. But after enough demand, Toyota did decide to sit down and come up with a plan to bring people what they wanted. Since Toyota knew that they couldn't afford to take all the risk here, Toyota actually teamed up with BMW to make the Super a reality in 2019 as the 2020 model year. The brand new Mark V A90 Supra was largely developed by BMW, being literally on the same platform as the BMW Z4, but then it was tuned by Toyota. And although the new Supra isn't powered by a Toyota engine per se, it remains very close to its roots. Although the engine would only make a proclaimed 15 more horsepower than its nearly 20 year old counterpart, the technology involved in this power would give the Mark V Super the ability to accelerate to 60, nearly an entire second quicker and rip the quarter mile also a second quicker as well, let alone now being able to generate over 1.05 G of cornering force and overall just does everything a lot better. And when you consider both inflation after 20 years and the collector car status of the Mark IV Super Turbo, the new Supra actually does it all better dare I say, for cheaper. And then for 2021, there's another big power bump and some common complaints that were addressed, none of which offering the car with a manual transmission. But let's be real, the ZF8 speed is an extremely good transmission and it fits the vehicle dynamics very well. With that, the extremely aggressive and almost exotic look of the A90 and then A91 Supra 
garners a ton of attention everywhere it goes. But with that being said, which Supra is the best Supra of all time? Is it the first generation that started it all? Is it the third generation that separated its nameplate into its own model and brought turbocharged six cylinders to the masses? Or is it the uber famous supercar slaying Mark IV that won the hearts of all of us? Well, I really wanted to give the Mark IV the W here. The Mark IV helped pave the way for a ton of enthusiasts to get into cars. It became the undefeated underdog of the battle of import versus domestic. And it was the poster car for many generations of car kids. But at the end of the day, with the Mark IV super prices making them completely and utterly unobtainable for the average car guy, I'm gonna have to give this one to the A90 and A91 Supra. Now that these cars have hit the used market and the hype starts to fall off, being able to buy one of these cars for forty dollars to $50,000 presents a ton of value for the money when you consider the 20-year-old version that's a lot slower, more fragile, and doesn't come with a warranty, costs the same amount of money. I get it, you're mad because nostalgia, and it makes total sense. The Mark IV is a priceless legend, but it is not the best Supra. But that about wraps it up for this special Supra episode of the What Generation is Best series. We will be making more videos just like this one, so please leave a comment and let us know what cars you guys want to see us cover next. Make sure you guys are subscribed and getting notifications to stay in the loop with all the crazy stuff that we're doing over here. And of course, don't forget to head over to fitmentindustries.com for any and all of your wheel, tire, and suspension needs. And we'll get you guys hooked up with exactly the setup you're looking for. I'm Sean, Sean Beta FI on Instagram. Thank you so much for watching. Peace.